Hello students. So chapter nine is all about finding and composing an image, how to best compose your shot. So far in this book, we've been talking a lot about uh, studying the theories behind all the different parameters like ISO and f-stop, aperture, and uh, shutter speed. But now let's talk about how all of those things, when you take a shot, how your composition or framing of the shot is going to be almost as equally important as to all of the parameters that we just discussed. So both of them work together the light exposure along with the content within your image. So for me, um, this was one of the toughest things to, to really understand and um, grasp, but once it did, it clicked and everything else kind of fell into place. And I'm not talking just about for photography, I'm talking about for all design elements or mediums that you use, whether it's for graphic design or videography or any kind of thing, looking rather than just seeing, learn to really open up your eyes and see what you see. Sometimes your eyes will play tricks on you, especially if you're in a place where you've been there a ton of times, because your brain is wanting to fill in information, even if it's not actually what's there. For instance, how many of us have lost their keys and couldn't find their keys only to have a friend come by and be like, oh, your keys are right on your desk. And that was the first place you looked. It's because your brain is uh, already filling in information <clears throat> and made you miss seeing that. Same thing with proofing a graphic design project. I can't tell you how many times I would look at a brochure or a flyer or whatever it was and not see um, blatant misspelling or something wrong in the copy and someone else comes by and reads it because it's their first time seeing it they pick it up immediately. It's the same type of principle here when you're trying to compose a shot, really opening your eyes and looking and seeing. The other thing is making sure that you get out a little bit. I know some of us may have a difficult time getting out because of COVID, but if you can get out, get to a place where you haven't been, where your brain cannot fill in that information so you can really see and focus on opening up your eyes. So I want you to be creative. So creativity versus just taking the shot. So you want to think about how you can make your interest in your subject matter of your photo or any design material the most interesting. You know, what can you do to the image to make it visually interesting, whether you're taking it before or after, meaning you can take or compose an image while you're taking the image um, with your camera and you can also pose and post. So I go back and forth between whether or not I want to create something that is completely straight out of the camera, this is the way the image is, or whether I want to take it in Lightroom and um, crop it down to where I see the visual interest. So knowing you have some of that flexibility in post does help. Take a look at this example where you see the flowers are all in focus and then you have that blurry depth of field behind it and there's a nice piece of space helping your eye move around this image. So if you were to have taken this image a lot larger and not have cropped in, whether or not you did it within your camera or you cropped in post, it may be a, a more um, less visually interesting. But by the cropping it down into this position, it really creates more drama in the image. Again, here with the cropping into an image and what that says about the image. When you're looking on the image in the, on the left where the um, child is giving somebody a flower, it's a precious moment. It's zoomed in and it's uh, you know, really kind of centering in the focal point on that flower that's being handed to um, the adult. Uh, that's creating a lot of visual interest, tension, and um, curiosity. You want to see it more. You want to look at it more. And the same goes with the positioning of the pier on the right side, where the crop factor has really created more visual interest than if they just showed a complete huge panorama of that um, pier. So some of the not so fun stuff is, you know, when you go out to shoot, especially your first shoot, you may get a little dirty. So wear clothes that you can um, get dirty and um, move easily in if you, in case you need to get down on the ground and shoot up or um, bend down and, and get your knees in some dirt because you're trying to get that perfect shot. Um, take the sunglasses and hats off while you're shooting. I like the hat actually because, um, but then again, I'm shooting mostly video. So I like being able to be able to see the back of the LCD screen really sharply because I can't tell you how many times 
that I come home and I thought I got the best shot in the world and then I realized I missed my focus because I couldn't see um, because the, the sun was so brightly shining on the back of that LCD screen. So I do find a little bit of shade kind of does help, but to each his own. Um, the best light is either in the early morning or late afternoon. I love to uh, shoot in the golden hour, which is really about, what, two hours before sunset is my favorite time. I'm not an early morning person, so I, you wouldn't find me out there in the morning unless I had to. But those are my tips. Um just be realistic with your expectations. You will miss shots. You will be disappointed, but keep trying and trying because when you finally get that shot, it's so worth it. Being able to uh, try and try and try. And then when you review all your images and you finally got one that you're so, so proud of, it is a great feeling. Now let's talk a little bit about lighting, uh, especially for the first few um, shoots. I want you using natural light. Um, the, you can use flash, but I would stare clear of the flash until we go over the lighting section. It's just a lot more difficult and tricky to work with, and there's plenty of natural light to work with outside, and I think that that's where you should be starting first. A successful photo is going to utilize the elements and principles of design, just like we learned in chapter one of um, the design one class in 121. I'm going to go over a little bit more of those things here, but just you know, as just a reminder, um, make sure you're always thinking of these things. Now let's talk about the rule of thirds. This is the principle of where you are, like the image here, breaking your image into three columns and three rows. And the rule of thirds is if you line up your subject along one of the leading lines going straight up and down the vertical ones, or you have your focus point or your um, where you want to bring draw attention to into where the intersections of those um, rows and columns are, that's going to create a lot of tension and visual interest in your image. The rule of thirds is one of those first techniques that photographers learn, and it really helps create a well-balanced and visually interesting shot. See here in this example where that little girl is standing off to the left, where those intersection points are and that one leading line to the left. It is creating the, your eye movement around that little girl, creating a lot of curiosity about what is she doing out there. It looks like it's going to storm. I wish she'd turn around and run. <laughs> but the, that's the type of um, visual interest that we're looking for in creating shots in photography. Now just to reiterate this a little bit better, just because I'm not in front of you and you're looking at this PowerPoint that I've built, um, the basic rules of the rule of thirds is whether you're going to use a third of your image in a long vertical line or whether, just like seen here in the red uh, lines, whether you're going to have your focal point fall within one of those um, intersections. Now you don't want to have your focal point fall in the middle of that because that's straight centering. It's to the right or the left in one of those um, intersecting points. The rule of thirds also gives you four lines that help you uh, position other elements in your photo as well. Here in this example you can see uh, the before and after. So the child is centered in the middle in the uh, above shot and towards the right third and using the rule of thirds for the bottom shot. So I feel like that's really to see it is to believe it. So you can see how much more visually pleasing the image is on the bottom than on the top. There's also stuff that stops your eye in the top one, like that fire extinguisher. So making sure that, um, you know, perhaps it would be a little bit more visually pleasing to me in that top photo if that was cropped out and the child was centered a little bit more, um, like the bottom one, but in the middle. So you're really going to use some judgment calls and what your background imagery is. Make sure that you're keeping that in mind um, and being cognizant, not just of your focal point, but the things in the background. In this example, you see the bee's eye is at the intersection, and that's really pulling you in and becoming the focal point. And another example of how the rule of thirds is used. In this shot, the subject is along the whole line, which means she is considerably off-centered and therefore creating and adding an additional point of interest. Placing her right in the center of the frame could have resulted in an awkward-looking shot. In a similar way, the one in the bottom has a good technique for landscape shots to position the horizon along one of the lines. 
here again in this example, the um, visual point of um, interest here is this girl's eye and um, creating that depth with the, with the depth of field behind her and that blurry background. Um, and along with her expression, there's a lot of tension and visual interest. And like I always say with a lot of different things in design, once you learn the rule, then you can understand why you want to break it. So here in this example where um, this girl is jumping and she's got um, some fabric that she's uh, got behind her, it doesn't really follow the rule of thirds, but it does um, create a lot of visual interest in the way that that fabric is leading towards her. So once you've learned it, experiment with purposely breaking it and seeing what you discover. And just like I said before, um, make sure that if you capture a shot and the composition of it isn't what you wanted it to be in post, you can always crop down. So think about that too. Sometimes I take things with a larger amount of space around all the edges from the focal point because I know that in my job I was going to have to uh, crop this vertically and horizontally and have it a square. So I was going to need the option to be able to move my focal point in the direction that I wanted. So some of that stuff can happen in post jet printers, exactly as you envisioned. It's a debate that's been raging on since the dawn of photography, the rule of thirds versus the golden ratio. So what are they, and is one really better than the other? Hey guys, Terry here for D News, and those of you who enjoy photography have probably heard of the rule of thirds. It's a general rule of composition for both photos and film, and it's the reason almost all cameras come with those little grid lines that divide the photo into nine equal sections. The basic formula is that the object you're trying to highlight or bring attention to in your photos should be positioned either along a grid line or at an intersection of two lines. The idea being that it creates more tension and interest than simply centering the object. For hundreds of years, the rule of thirds has been one of the most universally accepted guidelines for composing photographs. But recently, many have chosen to eschew it in favor of the golden ratio. So what is the golden ratio and how does it apply to photography? Well, much like pi, the golden ratio is an irrational number roughly approximated to 1.618. And that number is based on a very specific formula. Suppose you have a finite line A and somewhere in the middle of that line is a point separating it into two segments of different lengths. We'll call the longer line B and the shorter line C. Now, if you were to divide the length of B by C and it was equal to the length of A over B, then those two numbers would be in the golden ratio. And from there, you can create something called a golden spiral. It's a logarithmic spiral, which are found all over the place in nature, but with a growth factor that's equal to the golden ratio, meaning that for every quarter turn the spiral makes, the line gets one golden ratio further away from its center point, eventually creating something that looks like this. And it's this spiral that's the basis for the golden ratio rule of photography. The idea is that by overlaying the golden spiral on top of your photographs, you want the focal object to line up at the intersection of those two red lines. So if you were taking a portrait, for example, you'd want the person's eyes to be right around that point. You can also expand those red lines along the length of the image and mirror them on the other side, ultimately creating something called a phi grid, phi being the symbol for the golden ratio. So when people talk about using the golden ratio to compose their photos, what they're really talking about is using a phi grid instead of the grid used for the rule of thirds. As far as grids go, they look relatively similar, but a lot of people claim that the phi grid is actually a better choice because it produces a more balanced image, especially when it comes to landscape photography. The main complaint with the rule of thirds is that it can look too obvious, whereas the phi grid makes photos appear more natural and less rigid. For now, it seems like both options are still totally valid forms of photography, but the golden ratio is definitely the better choice for certain scenarios like landscapes, and in general, it's just a little more pleasing to the eye. Since we're talking about aesthetics, now's a good time to thank our sponsor. With Canon Pixma Pro. Did you know that there's a mathematical equation to help you frame your shots better? Now I know what you're thinking. Naris, my math skills are barely above that of an average ape. What are you talking about? I am talking about the Fibonacci sequence, also known as the golden spiral or the phi ratio, and I promise you it is not hard. The Fibonacci sequence is a mathematical formula that is found in all of nature and seems to be very deeply rooted in the universe. Now many famous paintings incorporate the Fibonacci ratio into their compositions as well. It's kind of confusing, but basically you have this infinite sequence of numbers that takes the sum of the two previous numbers in the sequence. So it's 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 55, and so on. 
You've heard of the rule of thirds. You place your subject on the left or the right third of your image, horizontally or vertically. Some people think that the rule of thirds is a reductive version of the golden spiral. But with Fibonacci, it adds one more element and it is the tail of the spiral, which functions as a visual guide using the surrounding points of the image to bring us to the key point, which is the center of the spiral. Now, I know you're probably thinking, Neris, why can't I just use the rule of thirds? The Fibonacci sequence takes the rule of thirds one step further. And instead of placing your subject on the third of your image, you imagine the Fibonacci ratio making a spiral over your frame and placing your subject on what is technically the 0.618 of your image or on a phi grid, which is basically like a more advanced version of the rule of thirds grid. Essentially, you wanna take the elements of your image composition and frame it to mimic the elements of the Fibonacci spiral. The Fibonacci sequence is rooted in our biology and appeals to how we evolutionarily find things aesthetically pleasing. So imagine how a few tiny shifts in your composition can make a huge difference in your image. Filmmaker Ali Shirazi made a video essay on the mathematical composition of Paul Thomas Anderson's There Will Be Blood, revealing several uses of the phi ratio in his framing. Even the Magic Lantern hack has a phi ratio overlay. So what's the takeaway from all this? Should you spend a lot of time trying to frame your subject exactly within the golden spiral? Should we do away with this whole rule of thirds thing forever? Well, of course not. Framing for the golden ratio is difficult, and while it can be a bit more aesthetically pleasing, it can't be done for every single shot. Try it for when you want to invoke a sense of balance in your scene or want to have a powerful and dynamic landscape composition. So there's your primer on how you can incorporate the golden ratio into your framing. What's your favorite way that you've seen the golden spiral in art or nature? Leave a comment below and the best answer will win an Aperture M9. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, the notification bell, and share this video. I'm Nares from The A-Team, stay golden. Here is the um, golden ratio in a uh, graphic that you could recreate should you want to try. I'm also going to put an overlay one on D2L for you to download and experiment with too as well. Here's another example of the golden ratio and how that look is overlaid this image and see how that it really does line up perfectly the focal point with um, this ratio. Now here are some other options for um, co composing a good image, and there's you know more than just the rule of thirds, the phi grid, and the um, the golden ratio. There's several other ones that I want you to make sure that you um, are looking for. You will want to have some images that are symmetrical. A lot of portraits are going to probably fall along that line, and then you also can create a lot of uh, visual interest with leading lines and how things um, how lines. Uh, lead the eye. So making sure that that background, especially if you're planning on keeping the background in focus, that there's some visual interest there as well. I'd keep this, I'd print this out and uh, keep this in my bag along with my exposure triangle um, little card that I had handed out earlier just in case you need some inspiration to try different types of shots with different things. All right, elements and principles of design. This is your first official photography assignment where you're going to need to come up with 30 shots and turn them in using either the contact sheet method in Photoshop or the Lightroom link that we learned last week. If you need any additional assistance on that, please let me know. I'd be happy to go over that with you. Now let's just review the elements of design. They're line, shape, texture, color, and value. Other things to consider, like we just learned in last week in chapter five for design one is the illusion of space and the illusion of motion. Keep those things in the forefront of your mind as well. So line, this one can be one of the most important ones uh, that can help you compose a wonderful shot. Uh, line is described as a path from point A to point B and conceptually is one dimensional, but graphically interpreted with marks that has a width in order to be understood. Lines can be implied uh, the viewer can create lines when multiple marks are placed geometrically within the frame. So this is just reviewing your um, what you know about lines. And here are some examples of the different line types that you can um, come across. Organic, rigid, and differing weights. So shape. There is a specific area defined by a boundary that is created by a line, value, contrast, or color contrast. Uh, this is probably one of the easiest ones to find out in nature, and pretty much everywhere there are shapes. Here are a few examples of shapes. We have the squares and rectangles, circles and ovals, and there's also organic shapes as well, and triangles, and all kinds of things that you can come up with shapes. Shapes can be 
you know, really rigid or they can be relaxed like a flower and a flower petal where it's more of an oval. Um, you can find shapes pretty much anywhere you look. Now texture was always one of my favorite things to integrate into um, design and any of my uh, compositions for um, ads and brochures and uh, booklets and whatever I, I was working on. I loved texture. So finding texture out in the real world is pretty easy. You could take photos of wood or sand or any of those things. I really find that texture can warm up an image and make it feel um, real. And some examples of that could be coarse, rough, or smooth. Color is the phenomenon of visible light wavelengths striking responsive nerve endings in the eye and being interpreted by the brain. And that is how we perceive color. Now in design one, we're going to go over chapter four in um, more detail uh, in, on uh, Tuesday and Thursday, depending upon when, when your class falls. But color is definitely one of those elements of design that you can play with in photography, and it's really fun and easy to do. And color isn't just color. Color could be contrast. It could be using um, color complements and analogs from the color wheel. There's warm colors and cool colors. Value uh, also often can be considered contrast. So when you're thinking about contrasting colors, that can help um, uh, elevate your value. I believe you just watched a video on um, Ansel Adams and his use of contrast. Uh, that is a definite way that you can bring in um, some of the added interest and in using your elements of design in your photography. Other things you can consider is space and the illusion of space and ways to achieve overlapping, diminishing size, decreasing contrast, and linear perspective. In this example, you see how depth of field has really broken that flower from the background so you can really see the space in between where that flower is and where the background is. Unity refers to the agreement between the parts of the design. Um, remember when we learned in chapter one and design one that unity and variety kind of work together. If unity keeps the balance, then variety is the thing that keeps the, the spice going and the, the visual interest into an image or design concept. Emphasis and focal point. Emphasis can attract the viewer's attention and you can have several points of emphasis in one photo or design. The focal point is the primary place of emphasis in the photo or design. The higher contrast between the yellow flowers in the background and the greenery provides multiple emphasis points, but the one large flower that is the focal point because of the size and clarity. Size and proportion. So size meaning scale and proportion refers to the relationship of the size between the parts of the photograph or design. So let's look at balance now. Balance is the equal dis distribution of weight. It can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. It can be a play on positive and negative space. And unbalanced visual can make the viewer feel uncomfortable, which could create the interest that you want in an image. It just depends on what you are trying to create. Rhythm. Rhythm is related to the sequencing of visual elements in a work. Con connects the illusion of motion and image and can be colors or lines. Subject and background. Also considered figure and ground. Subject and figure is the main focus of your image. The background and ground is the supporting role of your image in the backdrop. Proximity. Proximity is a visual grouping of objects together, related or unrelated. When two or more visual elements are in proximity, they are seen as being related or in a pattern. Similar shape is, um, can be used when your eye groups similar, similar shapes scattered around a photograph. Because your eye is moving across the image looking for similar shapes, this can create emotion. Similar color. At first glance, your eye sees a primary color in the photograph and then searches for a complementary color of that color. Color is always found um, and affected by the colors around it. Your eyes are always looking for pleasing colors and color contrasts. So there's a guideline for creating pleasing colors and combinations. And that's on the next slide. So here is the color wheel and Typically when you are moving straight across, so if you go and you look at the blue and you go straight across, its complementary color is orange. 
Its split complementary color is red, orange, and yellow, orange, which can be create some visual interest that goes beyond just its complement and something that I like to use a lot. But this color wheel really does help. If you have one of these, keep it with you so that you can see what kind of color contrast you can bring out in your photographs by um, looking at this. It can really help enhance the visual interest within your photo, especially if you're going for um, a pop of color. Well, your first photography assignment is due September 19th. You need to have 30 photos featuring the elements and principles of design. Those can be created in a contact sheet like we did in Photoshop on our first class, or it can be done in Lightroom like, we show, like I showed you last week um, using the link. If you need any help or further explanation with that, please let me know. I'd be happy to help you. And if you have any questions in general, please reach out. If I'm not available in my office, you can always find me at colleen.belzotti at htc.edu. And if you need further help, I'd be happy to jump on a Zoom with you at any time. But there'll be some more time during class on Wednesday to ask me some questions if you have them. So that's it for now, and see you Wednesday.